This is the fourth video in the topic on how does a nuclear power plant work. In this video we're going to be looking at nuclear power plants. In this video we're going to consider how a nuclear power plant works. A nuclear power plant basically converts the energy which it gains from nuclear fuel, nuclear reactions in nuclear fuel, and it converts this energy into electricity that can then be sent to our homes and businesses for us to use for whatever we so desire. So in this video, we're going to start by considering how we can convert the energy into electrical energy. And then we're going to look at specifically how a nuclear power plant works. So first of all, considering how we can generate a current. In the last topic, we saw that a current car carrying wire generates a magnetic field. Well, the opposite is actually true as well. Faraday discovered that if we have a changing magnetic field, then we get a current or an EMF generated. Now, an EMF stands for an electromotive force, which is really a very confusing name because it's not actually a force at all. It's a potential difference, which you've seen before as the voltage V. So Faraday's law can be written as the induced EMF, which usually has the symbol epsilon, but is just the voltage V, is equal to minus d phi B. So this, is, this d phi B stands for the change in the magnetic flux, over dt, which stands for the change in the time. Now, phi b is the magnetic flux, and the magnetic flux through a loop can be calculated using the formula that the magnetic flux is equal to b at e cos theta. In this case, b has the normal meaning. It is equal to the magnetic field strength measured in teslas. A is the surface area, and it's measured in meters squared. And theta is the angle between the direction which is perpendicular to the plane. So A is the area of the plane. And if we draw a line which is perpendicular to that plane, then that's the direction of the A. And it's the angle between the A and the B. So if the magnetic field is flowing perpendicular to the plane, up like this, in that case, the theta is 0 and cos theta is 1, and so the magnetic flux is just equal to BA. So we can actually visualize the magnetic flux as the number of field lines cutting through a certain area. So when the area is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines, we've got a maximum flux. It is equal to BA. If we now draw that area so that the plane is aligned with the magnetic field lines, as in this diagram, the BA is now equal to zero. So there are no field lines cutting through that area, and so the flux is zero. And so Faraday's law tells us that if we have a changing magnetic field, then we get some voltage induced in our loop. And we've met Ohm's law before, which relates voltage and currents. Ohm laws. Ohm's law tells us that V is equal to IR. And so if we get a voltage induced in a loop, then we also get a current induced in our loop. So basically, if we have a changing magnetic field through a loop, then we are going to get a current induced. And we can use this, we can send this current to people's homes, etc. So how can we get a how can we generate this changing magnetic field? Well, we don't actually change the magnetic field. What we do is change the magnetic flux. So if we just put a loop which can turn into a steady, constant magnetic field, then we have a constantly changing magnetic flux through that loop. When the magnetic field lines are like this and the loop is like this, there is zero field. And then when the loop is like this and the magnetic field lines are like this, we have a maximum flux. And so what we do is we use the energy which we get from whatever fuel we're using in our power plant to heat water. That heated water turns a turbine, and that turbine turns a coil of wire inside a magnetic field, and this generates a magnetic a current. 
So we've got a little demonstration of Faraday's law here. Here I've got a coil of wire and it's connected across a voltmeter which will measure the voltage generated in the wire. And here I've got some strong rare earth magnets. Now what I'm going to do is quickly put these rare earth magnets into the coil. You can see when the magnets are going into the coil, we get a voltage generated. If I hold them still inside the coil, there is no voltage generated, as even though there's a magnetic field now, there's no changing magnetic field. Now if I pull them out quickly, we get a voltage generated in the other direction. So you can't see that as clearly. But in and out. In and out. Now, to determine the direction in which the voltage is induced, we actually need to make some use of something called Lenz's Law. Lenz's Law is actually just a form of the conservation of energy. So Lenz's Law says that the induced current is going to oppose the change that induces it. So this means, imagine that we're moving a north pole of a magnet down towards a loop of wire we get a current induced in this loop of wire. And now that current is going to oppose the approaching North Pole. Now we know that like pairs repel. So this is going, going to tell us that the current needs to flow counterclockwise so that we get a North Pole generated on top of the coil of wire. And that North Pole, which is generated on top of the coil of wire, is going to oppose the approaching North Pole. And so this is a form of energy conservation because let's for a minute imagine that the opposite happened. Let's imagine that we put a North Pole going down towards a coil of wire here and that induced a South Pole on top of this coil of wire. Well in that case the South Pole would attract the North Pole and that would cause this magnet to move more rapidly towards this loop of wire. Now as it moved more rapidly, that would increase the amount of current which was generated, causing it to move even more rapidly still. And all this time we're not doing work on the system, we're not adding energy to it, but it's causing itself to go faster and faster and faster. And so this would break conservation of energy. And so Lenz's law say, states that the induced current must oppose the change that induces it. In Faraday's law, epsilon is equal to minus d phi b dt, that negative sign is actually Lenz's law. So that's where it comes from. Let's have a look at a nice demonstration now. So what we have here, held by Seb, is a plastic tube and a metal tube. What do you think is going to happen when I drop identical magnets through the two tubes? Just pause the video and think about it for a minute. Let's do the experiment now. The magnets are at the top of the two tubes and I'm letting go of them now. That was hard to see, so here's a different setting on the camera so that you can see it in slow action. Okay, and again. Okay, the magnet came out of the plastic tube a lot faster than the metal tube. Why do you think that was? That was because as the magnet fell through the, mag through the metal tube, the metal tube has a sea of electrons which are free to move. So a metal can conduct a current. So this means that as the, ma the magnet fell through the metal tube, it induced a current, and this current opposed the movement of the magnet. That's what Lenz's law tells us. So these induced currents actually have a special name. They can be called eddy currents in this case. Now there's one other thing that I want you to think about. I'm going to take away this plastic tube now.
And what I have here is a metal tube that has had a slice cut all the way down its length. Which one do you think the magnet's going to drop fastest through now? OK, let's see. So the magnet dropped faster through the one with the slit cut all the way down. That's because in this case we can't have currents flowing around in a full circle because when they get to the slit they are stopped. And so we cannot get as large an eddy current generated in this metal tube with the slit here. Let's have a look at a worked example now where we can use Faraday's law and Lenz's law to solve a problem. OK, so the question is, suppose that a conducting rod moves to the right with a speed of 5.0 metres per second in a 0 0.80 Tesla magnetic field directed into the screen. The rod has a length of 1.6 metres and negligible resistance. The light bulb has a resistance of 96 ohms. Find A the EMF produced in the rod, B, the current induced in the circuit, C, the electrical power delivered in the bulb, and D, the energy used by the bulb in 60 seconds. OK, so to answer part A, we're going to need to use Faraday's law. We know that the EMF induced is equal to minus the change in the magnetic flux with time. Now, the magnetic flux is equal to BA cos theta. In this case, the plane of this cross-sectional area of the loop is perpendicular to B. So theta is equal to zero, and so we've got that the flux is equal to BA. And the area is equal to the length, which we're told is equal to 1.6 metres, times this distance x here. So this is equal to b times the length times x. And now the only one of those which is changing, because what we care about is the change in the flux, b is constant, l is constant, so this is the thing that changes. And so we've got our EMF is equal to minus bl times the change in x over the change in t. Now we know that the change in x over the change in t well, that's what a velocity is, and we've got the velocity in this direction. So this is equal to minus b l v, and so now we can just substitute everything in. The negative sign is not important. It tells us in which direction the EMF is induced, but all we need to work out is what that voltage is. So the negative sign will be important for the current because it will tell us about the direction of the current, but let's ignore it for the EMF. So we've got 0 0.80 times the length, which is 1.6, times the velocity, which is 5.0. And solving that, we get 6.4 volts. Now part B, we now need to get the current induced. Let's start by thinking about the direction of the current. So we know that as this rod moves to the right, it's going to need to feel a force in the opposite direction to slow it down. That's what Lenz's law tells us. And so now we can make use of the right hand rule. We know the direction on the current is to the right, and our fingers are all pointing into the page. And so we can see that the current is going to have to be up the rod in this direction. And so now we've got the direction we can use V is equal to IR, Ohm's law, to get the I. So I is equal to V on R, V is 6.4, R is 96, and so solving this we get 0 0.067 amps, and then since it's going up here, we can say that that is counterclockwise looking from on top. Now part C, we need to get the electrical power delivered to the bulb. Well, P is equal to VI. That was from the first streetlight topic. And so the voltage is 6.4 volts. 
and the current is 0 0.067 and so this gives us 0 0.43 watts and then D we need to get the energy that it, it is expended in 60 seconds so energy is equal to power times time so that's 0 0.43 times 60 which gives us 26 joules So we've said that if we turn a loop in a magnetic field, then as the magnetic flux through that loop changes, we get an induced current. So let's just have a quick look at the equations to describe this. The magnetic flux for a loop of wire is given by B A cos theta. Now if we're turning it at a constant rate, that theta is changing at a constant rate. And so the theta is given by omega t, where omega is the angular frequency. And so we've now got that the magnetic flux through the loop is equal to BA cos omega t. Now we can use that along with Faraday's law, which tells us that the electromotive force is equal to the change in flux over the change in time to get that the electromotive force in this case is equal to BA omega sine omega t. You actually need to differentiate something to get that and this is a non-calculus based cost so you'll just have to trust me that that is what you get when you differentiate the magnetic flux. And so the EMF is given by this sine function which means that we can sketch it with a graph like this. So as the EMF or the voltage is constantly changing through that loop the current is also changing through the loop. So we actually get an induced changing current in our loop of wire. So let's just consider how this all fits together with a nuclear power plant or any power plant. In a nuclear or a coal powered power plant we burn the fuel, heats the water, as the water heats it produces steam, the steam rises, causes a turbine to turn, this turning force goes into turning the loop and that loop turning in the magnetic field then creates this changing current. Now there's a few design features that engineers add to make this more efficient. One of the most obvious ones is instead of just using one loop of wire, we tend to use a lot of loops of wire. So we introduce a, another factor, capital N, which is the number of loops that we have. So we can rewrite Faraday's law as the induced EMF is equal to minus n d phi b dt. Let's just do a worked example now where we calculate the induced voltage or EMF in a loop which is turning inside a magnetic field. So the question is, calculate the induced EMF if 25 turns of wire with an area of 1.2 metres by 1.2 metres are rotated in a 2.0 Tesla magnetic field. The loop rotates 20 times a second. Give the EMF as a function of time. So we know that our induced EMF is given by B A omega and then because we've got N turns we've got a factor of N sine omega t. Now omega is the angular frequency and so it's rotating 20 times a second so the regular frequency is 20 and so the angular frequency is equal to 40 pi. And so now we can just substitute everything into our EMF formula. We've got our magnetic field strength which is 2.0 times the area which is 1.2 meters by 1.2 meters times omega which is 40 pi times n the number of turns which is 25 times sine of 40 pi t. So this sine function is going to be our function of time it will oscillate between minus 1 and 1 but the rest we can solve on the calculator it is equal to 2880 sine 40 pi t now we should just give it to two significant figures, so let's write this as 2900 sine 40 pi t. 
So let's now consider where a nuclear power plant gets the energy that it needs to heat that water to make the steam, to turn the turbine, to turn the loop in the magnetic field and produce the current. So different types of nuclear power stations use different types of nuclear fuel. One of the very common types of nuclear fuel to use is uranium-235. So uranium-235 can be written as U, the mass number is 235 and the atomic number is 92. Now in order to get this to undergo a nuclear reaction, it needs to be bombarded with a slow moving neutron. If it's bombarded with a fast neutron, that neutron will collide with the nucleus and bounce off it, leaving the nucleus unchanged. If it's bombarded with a slow moving neutron, then that neutron will stick to that nucleus, giving us uranium-236. So we can write the equation for this process as the uranium-235 plus the neutron goes to uranium-236. Now that uranium-236 is very unstable. And so it is going to decay into or undergo nuclear fission where it splits apart and forms two lighter nuclei which have a higher energy binding energy per nucleon and in the process that is going to release energy. So uranium-236 decays into barium-143 and krypton-91 and in this process it releases two neutrons. So this is actually what's known as a chain reaction as it takes one neutron to start the reaction and two neutrons are released during the reaction. So this means that if we start this reaction and we don't moderate it or stop it, then we end up with an explosion very quickly, which is exactly how nuclear bombs work. So chain reactions can actually be modelled quite nicely with balls and mouse traps. Let's have a look at this model of a chain reaction now. So now we've seen a chain reaction. A nuclear bomb consists of a critical mass of a fissionable substance and it's generally shaped like a sphere because it's harder for neutrons to escape from a sphere without hitting a uranium nucleus on the way. And so the critical mass actually depends a bit on the shape of the material as well. But if you want to make a bomb, then you need to make a spherical shape. And generally what they did was they had two spheres which were separated. They then dropped them. When the bomb lands, these two spheres come together and suddenly you have a critical mass and it starts to undergo an uncontrolled chain reaction. Now clearly we do not want that to take place in a nuclear power plant. So nuclear power plants have what's called control rods, which are rods that can be dumped down among the fuel cells in order to absorb excess neutrons. So the chain reactions in nuclear power plants are very carefully monitored and these control rods drop down or up in order to control the reaction rate and to keep it constant. So this diagram here shows the basic design of a nuclear power plant. In the nuclear power plant we have the fuel which is generally put as little pellets into a tube and we have the control rods among those tubes. We then surround all this with water. Now the water is very important for two reasons. For one, it heats up and produces steam and this steam turns the turbines. But the second function it 
performs is that the neutrons released from that chain reaction can collide with the water molecules and this is a very effective way of slowing them down. And it's actually only the slow neutrons which are going to cause the uranium to undergo nuclear fission. So we need to slow them down in order to make them useful. So the other main features of our power plant are that we've got the steam going through the turbine which is connected to the generator, which is connected to the power cables. When the steam has gone through the turbine, it then goes through a condenser which cools it down. So this condenser is kept cold with another source of water and then once the steam has been condensed in the condenser, it can be sent back to the nuclear power plant to be used again. So this is a very rudimentary nuclear power plant. There's a lot of design features which are now included to make these even safer. So there's been a few big nuclear disasters in the past. For example, in the USA, there was a big disaster at Three Mile Island in 1979. In 1986, Chernobyl, which was then in the Soviet Union, had a big disaster at their nuclear power plant. And more recently, the Fukushima Daiichi reactor in Japan had a accident in 2011 following a tsunami. Generally now, nuclear power plants, or the new ones, are very well designed and it's highly unlikely that an accident is going to happen. However, all nuclear power plants do produce waste fuel. So the, once the fuel's been spent, then we've still got some radioactive substances left. And these need to be carefully stored in lots of concrete or in lead so that the radiation cannot escape and damage people. So that's a big disadvantage with nuclear power plants. One of the big advantages is that nuclear power plants do not produce carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So they're not contributing to global warming. So there's a lot of debate about how environmentally friendly nuclear power actually is. And if you want to debate it on the forums, then feel free to do so. So in this video, we've seen how moving a loop of wire through a magnetic field will generate a current, and how this is used in power stations, which are powered through the release of energy from a fuel to heat water to produce steam, turning a turbine, which then turns the generator and gives us current. In the next video, we're going to be looking at how we get that current from the nuclear power plant to our homes and offices so that we can use it. And on the way, we want to lose as little of that power as possible. Thanks very much to Sebastian Frick for filming this video. And thanks to these people for doing the experiment with the mousetraps and placing it up on YouTube.